Please welcome the writer, co-director, and the star of We'll Never Have Paris, Simon Helberg. Congratulations. Hi. Thank you, guys. Thank I you got a coming. chance to um, see the movie last night, Simon. It's a lot of fun. It's Thanks. very, very funny. Appreciate that. And it's also very, very autobiographical. Yes, yeah, uh, it, it, unfortunately, in, in more ways than I, I wish to admit, but I, I must, since you are all here waiting for my confession. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes, and uh, my wife and I uh, had a pretty rocky, clumsy road before we got uh, married, and this is, this is the story, and we actually directed this together. So we went back, told the story of our demise uh, on film uh, in some strange masochistic uh, move. I, um, so, there, so there it is, and, and now we invite people to laugh at our pain. Uh. Well, you know, what I find fascinating about that is that most of us really try to forget when we have tremendous romantic screw-ups. Yes. That's where disease comes from. Be, yeah, we're we're going to get rid of disease pretty soon if we keep making movies like this. Um, yeah, you want things to fester. Uh, but uh, no, I decided to go back to the exact location uh, in which I made all of these poor decisions and, uh, yeah, reenact them. Bring a film crew. And this time, I, I let my wife actually call the shot. So it's like if you have an argument with somebody or you do something terrible, yeah, you usually try to sweep it under the rug. You don't go back and say, let's redo this. And now you also get to tell me what to do, how to do it better. So it kind of was like a great revenge for her. I think maybe it was her plan all along. Um, but before you let her get that revenge, you wrote the script without even telling her you were writing it, right? Yes, the the genius that I am. Uh, that seems I, risky. Yeah, it was, it was the, the cherry on top of uh, a bunch of clumsy moves. So yeah, I, I had, we had a, a, it was a pretty disastrous road getting to where we are, and it was such an embarrassing proposal that she hadn't even told her family or friends, and I think everybody probably can relate to a less than ideal proposal, but this was, this is the, the Chernobyl of proposals, as I like to call it. And, uh, and then, yeah, the, the, the icing on the cake was that I then decided to write this script and I had started telling people around town uh, this story, which they thought was hilarious, but I forgot that she hadn't told anybody that story. So um, it, this, this movie might actually, the sequel will be how this movie actually did destroy our, our relationship. Um, but she, she thought it was funny. That was, I guess, she was the toughest critic. So I tried to be honest. Uh, I tried to be you know, tell an entertaining uh, story, just the way that I would sit down and tell somebody, you know, hey, you want to hear the craziest proposal story of all time? And, and, uh, and I guess that would, that's the film we made. And we'll talk in a second about the, your character in the film, Quinn, who basically has these experiences that are very much like your own and, yes. and your wife's. I don't know where I but, got it. But, um, but I'm curious about when you were, actually, when these things were happening to you, when you were having these... Uh, terrible proposal type lead up with your own wife and when things were going wrong in your own relationship and it looked like you were not going to in fact marry your wife you were writing all of things these things down in preparation to write the script i heard to, so, right? to a degree i not I, I mean that would make me sound very la kid of you yeah that's like the most uh, horrible what a shallow person i must have been uh that that not exactly writing it down like to uh in the hopes of one day making a movie out of it, exactly. It's, it was more so that I would believe that I was actually experiencing those things because they were that insane. And, you know, following her to Paris and her meeting a Frenchman and, and having to stay in the apartment that she was subletting from that Frenchman. So I was staying in this guy's apartment that she was falling in love with, uh, sleeping in his bed. He was gone. But that would have been really crazy. But uh, it was, you know, so it was like I, I started, yeah, I started writing it down. And I don't know if I was you know, uh, if the movie was being informed by these decisions or, you know, or, a, or my, my decisions were being informed by romantic comedies. Or, you know, as I was sitting on an airplane going to France, I definitely had a moment of like, oh, this is straight out of a romantic this comedy. act two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is, this is going to blow them away. Except usually, though, you show up in France, that's the, that's the you know, that's happy the, ending, the right? sweet uh, tidy ending, except in in this case, I knocked on the door and uh, I it looked like she wanted to 
have me committed. So I, I knew I had made a mistake. So we should say for those who haven't yet had a chance to see the film, and you can, in fact, see it in theaters starting tonight and video on demand, iTunes, everything starting tomorrow. Your character, Quinn, is about to propose to his girlfriend. And yes. then? And then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, life and, and art are, are at, th at this point, the movie is definitely a, a, a bit of a departure from what exactly happened. So I'll, I'll talk about what happens in the film as opposed to, to, to life. And it's hard for me to remember which is which. But in the film, uh, yeah, very happy. My character is in a content uh, that been in a relationship for 10 years, been trying to propose for a while, but just never got around to it. Um, and has a, an epiphany he's going to propose and then this beautiful tall blonde coworker uh that that he works with confesses she might have feelings for him i think you know in fear that she might lose this guy as a friend once he gets married and she dates kind of these like homunculus sort of meathead guys and he's a sort of dorky intellectual so she thinks yeah maybe i need a sensitive guy like him and it throws him off completely he thinks oh my god a, a tall blonde girl how i gotta i gotta explore this i gotta sow my oats i gotta be a man um and after you know trying to to sow an oat failing and uh exploring his manhood which was a, just a, a small little well of manhood uh quinn runs back to to his true love Devin, and she's fled to paris uh and so it's just this whirlwind of Again, of, of, of bad decisions and... Hilarity uh, ensues. Hilarity, hilarity does ensue. Um, there are a bunch of great moments in the film I want to talk about, but we've got a couple of clips here. Yeah. Starting with one where your character, Quinn, is with Kelsey, played yes. by... Yes, yes, played by Maggie Grace, uh, who's beautiful and wonderful and, and taken and lost and many other wonderful things uh, and she is the blonde in the uh, the character I was describing and, and this is the scene after she's I said hey I'm going to propose to my girlfriend and she said oh my god I think I might have feelings for you, for you. and I said oh wait and then we all were going out to get pizza and uh, she shows up with the guy she's dating and I'm there with my girlfriend and it's, it's, a, it's just an awkward dinner let's take a look whoops <laughs> Um, I don't want to get too personal, but Maggie Grace has a great line in the film that I wonder how autobiographical that is, too. And she says, Quinn, are you really going to marry the very first woman you've ever been with? Yeah, it's kind of the crux of, I guess, my character's dilemma. That, I don't, no, no one really ever, I don't think anyone said that to me. I think I said that to myself, probably, which, you know, it's... Uh, I didn't, again, I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't lived a, a wild, debaucherous right. life, uh, and had, I hadn't, you know, left a, a, a sea of women in my dust. Uh, so I was, I was confused, and I thought, well, God, I don't know, I'm 25, and uh, should I marry, really, essentially, the first girl that I, I've ever been with? Is that what's going to happen? Am I going to get curious? And this girl just said she liked me. I think I think the you know the floodgates are about to open here and let let the ladies in and then I just stood there and the gates creaked open and then creaked closed um, and so uh, yeah so I think that that was the dilemma it's kind of and I think a lot of people have that and I, when, you, when you're going to get married do you get married you sort of see the end of your life uh, you see your mortality I mean it's a wonderful beautiful thing but there is this kind of uh, f finality to yeah. it. So I, I, I had, I had some concerns, and uh, I just handled it terribly. Um, yes, you did. Yeah. yeah. Did Did your wife Jocelyn Town, who co-directed the film with you, have any trepidation about going through this process again through the making of the film? Yeah, I mean, I, I think naturally it was. It's, it, I swear it's not really until like moments like this or the last two days where I'm like, oh wait a minute, this we just made that. That's going out into the world that everyone can go see it. Uh, I'm not here to tell you not to go see it, but uh, oh my God, it gives me a little heart attack when I think of people being on their you own free see will. It. You should see it. Uh, and I, I will still, I'll have a heart attack either way, just throughout the day, many little palpitations. I, it, it is, it's a vulnerable thing. I, I enjoy, uh, I think, the, I wanted to show this raw underbelly I guess of of myself and and what I thought maybe other people might relate to and and it's a it's the most humiliating side uh and experience uh, in, in my life and I I don't know I guess I get some kind of weird perverse joy out of just saying hey here I am warts and all and it's not the most favorable light uh but 
it's for me it was it was I guess it was real and I think uh, I don't know people tend to hopefully connect to things that are real well and not only that but I think you've taken on lots of big jobs and responsibilities in a feature film like this this is you've written before obviously but this is the first time you've written a feature film um, this is your first time co-directing a feature film yeah and you are literally like in every scene in this movie so you are front and center it's a great ensemble cast yeah but the camera is squarely on you yes how did it feel to move from <laughs> someone who really obviously you work in ensemble comedy every week how did it feel to basically go right sort of front and center and have that responsibility on your shoulders well it's why I, my, my, it's why I wanted my wife to direct it with me. I mean, aside from her being a great director, she had written and directed a movie before this. It's a completely different story. But, and we'd worked together in theater and done stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, I, needed, I needed help. And I also thought, you know, a female perspective, and not to mention it being our story. Uh, but it was hard. I, I had to kind of... Uh, um, compartmentalize each each job. I, I when I showed up on set, I just wanted I really wanted to just be an actor and be there for the other actors and for my performance. And even though I'm playing a version of myself, it still was a demanding, challenging role. And then uh, and then do all the prep work at home as a director uh, the night before and and get every. So I, I tried to kind of and then do writing. I, you know, I wrote it before we started, obviously. So I tried to sort of isolate them, but very hard. I, if you're making a movie, maybe don't have the character be narcissistic uh, because then they'll tend to be in every scene um, because this guy was obsessed uh, with himself and couldn't get out of his own way. And then I made a movie about it uh, where I played every role outside of the, you know, uh, on the other side of the camera. So yeah, it's it. There's I tried not to be too indulgent, but uh, there's a there, Lena there Dunham thing going on there. What's that? Like a Lena Dunham thing going on. <laughs> yes, you know, well, all these responsibilities. I, I, that would be that's a compliment. Yeah. yeah so, no, um, for sure. Yeah. So it's uh, it was it was very challenging. Was it tough to convince folks to back this movie because it's a very personal story, and then you also have you and your wife directing it, which makes it even more sort of personalized. And it's tough getting any film made. Was it tough to get a film like this made just because you had to convince folks that you were ready for this? Yeah, yeah. It was unbelievably hard. I don't even know how to begin. Uh, I don't even know how we did it, ultimately. I mean, and it, and it wasn't for lack of excitement about the script. I don't say that as like a self-congratulatory thing. It, pe people really did like the script. People kind of jumped on board quickly. Uh, and then we sort of sat for a while, we kind of had to revamp things to get it moving again. But this budget range and this style movie and uh, all these things, you, know, you look at the movies, look at the theater, I'm sure the movies that we're playing with this weekend are quite different. Uh, I'm sure there's Boy superheroes. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's there's guns and superheroes and, and sequels and franchises and it's just a hard thing. So um, in some ways it's, you know, it can be harder to get, you know, a couple million dollars for a movie than it can to be to, to get fifty million. Yeah, it, it's actually shocking and strange. But uh, even with a fantastic cast, so it, it took a lot of willpower and a lot of bullheaded, uh, relentless perseverance. And and then it's also you're you're pushing your own story. So right. I, I don't know for somebody who's somewhat or deeply insecure it's weird to be out there saying this story needs to be heard and it's about me and I wrote it I'm gonna be in it I'm gonna direct it I'm gonna produce it so but it's great yeah you know I don't like to go out and self-promote um that no, much, it is funny. As just, I said here, self-promoting. But well, yeah. no, but just observing you back in the green room and here, I do get the sense that you are not a self-promoting person, and therefore, this is even like a bigger task to sort of bring this to happen. And the, the choices that you make in casting are really interesting. I mean, Melanie Linsky, who's wonderful and plays your oh, wife yeah. in the film, so great. How did you decide to ask her to do it? Because also, the combination of you and her as a believable couple is really the crux of the film. Yeah, yeah, and her character is, you know, again, it, I'm in every scene, and so it, it's my character's journey. So in some ways, some of the other characters don't, you know, none of them have as much screen time as me, but it's, you know, our relationship is at the center, even though it's through my eyes. And so we needed somebody that you could hopefully fall in love with at first glance, and that was somewhat maternal, but sexy, and the kind of girl that, you know, everybody is in love with, but you sort of think you're the only one. That was kind of how I pictured her. And she is, the, and she's so great and natural, and she's funny, and you just, 
you care about her when you see her and you're charmed by her. And so even though we don't set up, uh, the movie just jumps right in essentially. And uh, that was something that was kind of a struggle and I think a, you know, something that, that worked well too, but it was, it was a struggle in the sense that it's hard to jump into a movie without getting to know people. But I felt that we could get some mileage out of how wonderful she is just, uh, you know, looking at her and, and hearing her speak. And so she, yeah, that was an easy decision. And she knew you guys before, right? So she had seen this story up close. She had we, lived yeah. the actual story. We actually story. didn't know her. Yeah, we did know her when we were going through this breakup in real life, which is, is bizarre. Um, and then, yeah. And there are other and the other person in the movie that I did know that's one of my best friends is Jason Ritter, and he plays her brother, uh, who we're all friends with in life. It was a very incestuous thing. And then the other cast was just... Um, cold calling or writing, you know, Alfred Molina and Maggie Grace and Zachary Quinto, all people I didn't know and are all so wonderful. And Judith Light. Judith Light is um, amazing in anything. Yeah. Just the, it, It's a short bit in the film, yeah. but boy, she pops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, and Kathleen Chauvin was our casting director who does like huge movies along with, you know, also art, art house movies, but like Spider-Man, but then she did John Adams and she's a New York casting director and we shot in Brooklyn, you know, and originally I, I wrote it I didn't want the location to be a character in the movie, except for Paris, but I didn't want the whole America part to matter that much, I guess. Uh, but I guess I had written it for L.A. because I had a lot of driving things and going up the coast and stuff. And so we decided to shoot in Brooklyn, and I had to, I had to alter it, but it brought all of these wonderful New York actors. And Brooklyn, the locations, all the interiors of Paris are shot in Brooklyn as well, uh, which is, I don't know if that's a fun Brooklyn fact. Brooklyn is better than a, Paris anyway. I yes I I opt I opt for Brooklyn so uh, yeah it was it was uh, it was the biggest heat wave in forty years in New York so uh, uh, that was people were passing out from heat stroke which was fun and there's if you look closely you'll see sweat pouring off of my face throughout moments but it's good because I was supposed to be a very panic ridden person so um, sweat was 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 an added. Uh, feature. And in terms of your own personal panic, what part of this made you most nervous? Because here you are carrying big parts of this movie on lots of fronts, from the writing, co-directing, acting, or even, I'm sure, getting the financing, etc. So what part sort of weighed most heavily on you? And today now, with the release, I'm sure you are also sort of on pins and needles and seeing how... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, if you're asking me to pick a part uh, of this journey that caused me the most panic, I, I'd say I can't pick one because it was a steady flow of I lost 15 pounds making this movie which is ridiculous because I weigh like I think 45 pounds total so I was it was very bizarre uh, to see me get skinnier and you can see it in the movie it was just yeah it, and that was partially heat wave and partially stress and um, yeah I'm just trying I don't know it's it's a uh, I guess you know, no matter what we do, whether it's Big Bang or this, or if I wrote it or didn't, it's always vulnerable putting yourself out there. This is a bit heightened, and uh, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm trying to breathe through it. But uh, but I think we made a really funny movie, and it, it's it's personal, and it's, you know, there are moments that are dark and gritty, and there are moments that are fluffy, and there's, you know, popcorn moments, and there's whatever. There there's a whole uh, slew of. Uh, I guess it's it's a lot of, of me up there, and you know. There's a scene that I think brings a lot of these moments to the fore, which is when you are in Paris and you come across your would-be wife, who yes. is now with someone else, with a French violinist, really. Yes. Um, so let's see, show that clip, and uh, yeah, this is him. Where I've I've crashed the grandparents, my my wife's grandparents' apartment in France, and uh, I showed up there to continually badger her and try to win her back and uh the, the the frenchman that she was falling for happens to be there and uh is pontificating about his little violin and that act that's eben moss Bacharach is his name that actor he's on girls now i don't know if people watch girls there's a famous thing he just did on girls yes very even famous. if you don't watch girls you probably saw uh I gave him that idea. Uh, he's he's amazing and uh, is the one thing for me, really, that I, I just die laughing at every... I've seen the movie a thousand times and he continues to make me laugh. So that's uh, Guillaume, the other man. Um, and my character plays... Uh, I work in a floral shop, but I, I'm this 
piano player who's too embarrassed to play in front of people and um, and uh, yeah, trying to get a gig at a Thai restaurant playing jazz, and he's this virtuoso violinist, and so there is a showdown uh, inevitably that that must happen, um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's it that. That I never met the real Frenchman, thank God. But uh, I tried to make him annoyingly nice and charming. Because what's wor- there's nothing worse than that. If he was mean and villainous, he'd right. be like, but just really charismatic. Um, <laughs> so annoying. There's some great scenes with him in there. Yeah, yeah. It really does work. We're going to take questions in a second. I just want to ask you um, a question about what lessons you were able to bring. And maybe there aren't any, or maybe there are many from your experiences on Big Bang into a set like this? Because it's obviously a very different experience. I'm curious what things felt very much the same and what things felt like you were literally recreating the wheel. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, my role on Big Bang is, is an actor. And, and it, there is a, um, forgive the pun, I guess, but there, there's somewhat more of a science to, to what we do over there in terms of... Well, you know, the writers are incredible and there's a rhythm and there's jokes and you have to land them. And I mean, that's not your intention. You want to play, you're, you're an actor, so you're not trying to, you're not up the stand up. You're, you're, you're trying to be truthful and, and, and everything. But, but yeah, there's a little bit more of a, a, a science to it, I guess. And, and it's a different medium. Obviously we're shooting a big bang. We shoot from an audience and four cameras. And if there's, if, the laughs aren't coming. They'll rewrite it, and and it's it's it. I guess in some ways, laughs are a, a priority. I was making a comedy, so I was hoping for laughs, but no one's laughing on, on the set, uh, and you don't know, uh, you don't know how that's gonna play out later when you edit it all together. But I mean, what I what I did what I did try to take into this is the getting in and out of scenes and a rhythm and a pace um, that you see on TV, and and sometimes people seem to disparage it. I don't know. I, I, I think people talk pejoratively about a sitcom or this or that. It's kind of like light fodder. And, and sometimes it is. And that's okay, too. But I think um, y- you, you do... You have 22 minutes to tell a story on a sitcom. And, uh, and the rhythm is, should be tight. And the ins and outs of the scenes should be clear and funny. And, and so, um, yeah, I tried to bring, I tried to bring some of, of that, I guess, uh, just... The pace, that that was my main. There are laugh out loud jokes, including you make an Anne Frank joke that works. And I thought, wow, that what is Anne Frank really, joke doesn't work, honestly. That is really brave. Um, Pablo, should we turn it over to questions? Um, I did want to ask you, you know, when you make a movie about Paris, don't you have lots of people, especially about romance in Paris, don't you have people coming to you and sharing with you, you know, they want to like connect and they want to emote and give you their romantic stories. And have you heard some very funny stories of their own, ex- other people's experiences? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, um, I, I, that was sort of what compelled me to really sit down and write this, was that every time I, I would tell somebody uh, this story, they would all have their own version of it. Um, and not quite as intercontinentally, yeah, <laughs> there you go, you, you, you as well. So uh, yeah, they didn't usually span continents and have quite the humiliation factor, but um, so yeah, I think that's a common thing. I think people to feel like they're in control or something have to kind of, you know, set fire to their life and, and take themselves out of their comfort zone and then prove that they can put it all back together again or, um, or, or you know, and I don't think that is a reflection of whether you're in love or not in love. I, I think I was in love with, uh, you know, with my wife. I just, I I just self-destructed. So uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of people come out of the, come out of the woodwork and and uh, say, "Oh my God, our breakup before we got you know." And, and everyone's like, "I had this proposal. It was going to be rose petals, or uh, there was going to be a skywriting, and you know, the plane ran out of gas, and it was just black smoke, or whatever. No, nothing ever worked out the way you know. And it usually doesn't always work out exactly how we hope. So this is, I guess, a chance to laugh at that. Hello. Hi. Um, I just had. A, did you always want to study comedy, or did you lean towards? Um, I, uh, I think once I started acting, I I I definitely gravitated towards comedy. But uh, I actually wanted to study drama more because I I felt a little more comfortable in comedy than I did in drama. And then I, st- I studied at NYU and and. Um, the first year, one of my teachers said, "You can't don't don't do any more comedy. 
you need to only do drama because I just was comfortable with that. With and so I did kind of get forced into studying, you know, Richard the Second and doing all of these, you know, Chekhov and Greek plays and things that. Uh, Although Chekhov is kind of comedy, ultimately. That's the secret of Chekhov. There it is. I told you. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I, I, uh, I obviously love doing comedy, but um, it's kind of all the same, really, I think, at the end of the day. Just whatever the writing is, you know, will dictate. It's all, you're all, always trying to do the same thing out there. But. Yeah, hi, I just wanted hey. to ask, what's your favorite movie, like, ever? My favorite movie yeah. ever? Uh, Oh wow! Uh, it's hard to pick one. I mean, I I I would say Annie Hall is up there, and Tootsie is up there. Um, Dog Day Afternoon is one of my favorites. I'll, I know that's three movies, but they're all kind of like those are movies that have changed me or inspired me, or that I would watch no matter what time of day. And uh, yeah, so those are those are some good ones. Hi, Simon. Hi. You look great. I, do, I know. <laughs> um, I actually had two questions for you. Um, yes. When you decided to make this film, did you already have this story in mind, or did you have another story? Uh, when I decided to make this film? Or I guess, I, sorry, oh, a excuse film, me, a film, yeah. I didn't really go about it that way, actually. I went about it by the story first. I wanted to tell this story. So I... Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I didn't sort of. I didn't decide that I wanted to make a movie. I, I I wanted to make this one, and and I think that I don't know. I I, I think that's sort of the, a good way. It's like a good barometer, I think, to have in terms of what you do for me. I mean, I, everyone's different, but just uh, I, I felt like, oh, I have to. I have to tell this story. I I don't know if I want to be a director exactly, but oh no, but I have to direct this, and and that's I guess the way that I would probably choose things in the future and. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and then my other question was, do you think you're planning to make additional movies after this, or, or what? I guess what's your plans? Um, I guess if if the uh, if I'm compelled to tell a specific story, and uh, you know, yeah, in terms of directing at least, uh, acting obviously, I I'm a whore. I'll do anything. So what do what do you got? Uh, no, yeah. So I, I that's sort of where I'm. I don't have a plan at the moment to direct another thing, but uh, always think, thinking of ideas and, yeah. Hi, I was just Hi. wondering if working with Aaron Sorkin on Studio 60 impacted the way that you wrote. Because he's known as being a specific writer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I hope I could, one you know, millionth of his talent rubbed off on me i i um he's a yeah i think there is something again i i don't know it's, it's like the rhythmic about i mean I, he's like it's like it's like david mamet or you know you're you there's a song i mean uh, sometimes literally with aaron sorkin but there that rhythm of things and you know uh it's and obviously a lot of his characters are are versions of him, and sometimes he gets criticized for that, but I think, I don't see any, I think that's fantastic. But yeah, I, I, I think the rhythm of it uh, uh, is a huge, huge part. I, I, I don't know, I think it's, it's like writing a song, uh, you know, the notes are part of it, but, but the, the rhythms are pretty essential. And so from him, I, when I hear that kind of musicality, I, it, it, I, it probably resonated with me somewhat, at least subconsciously. There's no like political drama in my movie. I definitely didn't go down that road. Uh, and he has so many phrases that I think he always says like, "For what it's worth," or "For my money." Uh, so I don't think I, you know, I didn't butter both sides of my bread. Uh, none of that. Those kind of slick colloquialisms, uh, and not a lot of steady cam shots. So um, yeah. What made you want to become an actor, and what is the hardest thing about it? Uh, man, I, um, I think I, I, I grew up around it, uh, you know, my dad is an actor and, and, um, and I, I guess I saw all sides of it. I mean, I, I saw the hard, the hard parts of the business and, and successes and failures and everything in between. And so I knew it wasn't glamorous or easy, uh, but I thought, well, I'll try out for a school play and I think maybe I could make people laugh and maybe girls, more girls will see 
me be funny, uh, therefore increasing my odds at maybe hugging a girl, uh, holding her hand, touching the side of her face, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and, uh, and so I auditioned and I, I did, I m m like probably butchered what was this incredibly dramatic play. I had one little scene and it was, I, I turned it into a farcical comedy, but I got huge laughs and I thought, oh, this is fun. Um, and I, I was doing a lot of music before that and I kind of dropped doing that and went to college to study at NYU. And so I, I, I guess, A, I didn't finish, I'll be honest, I didn't finish college, but I do really recommend studying. I think that is going to You'll also know if you really want to do it, I think. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, the hardest part is that uh, the most successful person out there has had probably a thousand to one rejections, you know, uh, that, and that's the top, top of the one percent. It is for every job, it's a thousand rejections. And even within the job, it, it's, it's really hard. I, I don't know. It's hard to make sense of being rejected that much um, and feel like not and not feel rejected, I guess. I, I think it's like you're inevitably putting your fate in other people's hands. And so to maintain some kind of belief as to why you're doing it or confidence while in, inherently in the job, it's just a, a slew of uh, rejections and sometimes it has nothing to do with you or your talent. And sometimes it does. But I, so, yeah, it's kind of a uh, I guess the perseverance of it is um, is challenging, but uh, you know, and I've had many, many, many rejections, and they all they all hurt, and they still hurt. Uh, so, uh, and in some ways, you get more vulnerable, even with the more success you have. So that I don't know that vulnerability, um, that's that's hard. That's the hardest part, right? That's the hardest part, like in acting. Well, like, what have I you ever mean, found hard? in the, yeah, in the endeavor of acting, I would say, yeah. I mean, in terms of the technicality of acting, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think just as, as a, as a life decision, I think it, that, that is, that is the challenge. Um, but when, when you, you know, when you study it and all that, you get to see all the, you get a little glimpse of to what you're getting into. So it's usually a good way to kind of decide whether it's for you or not, um, I mean, that's just my opinion. Thank you. Uh, hi, Simon. Hi. Uh, I have a question. How did you come up with the name We Will Never Have Paris? Is there a story behind it? Um, well, in, in Casablanca, uh, he, there, there's a famous, the famous line is, we'll always have Paris. And um, you see what I did there? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just a play on that, somewhat of an anti-romantic uh, comedy and uh, Paris murdered me um, the most romantic city in the world not a great place to to have uh, y y to be breaking up um, that that city is it's just a monolith of, of romance and if and y I, it dwarfed me and um, sent me back home crying in a puddle of tears and anxiety and yet now you always do have it because now it's commemorated yes. forevermore in yes. your film. Yes, I, I didn't think that through. <laughs> Why did I do that? Too late, too yeah. late. Simon Helberg, thank you so much for being here. We'll never have Paris. 